Very good. Hello. So it's Theo Blackmore here again from Disability Cornwall and the Isles of Scilly. And I'm talking to... Reed from Wiltshire Centre for Independent Living in Wiltshire. Brilliant. Whereabouts in Wiltshire are you? So we're based right in the very centre in Devizes. Um, and, uh, but the reason we're, that we cover the whole of Wiltshire and the reason we're there is because it's a bit of a, well, as you know, Theo, bit of a county to navigate and so um like Cornwall so we just tried to be as central as we could really you know it's amazing I had a quick look on the map before we having this conversation and Wiltshire you know you've got some well you've got the motorway across the top and you've probably got the A30 across the bottom and or the A308 or A309 303 303 road to the sun <laughs> and then you've got in the middle of it you've only got Stonehenge and you've got cities kind of in it and around it so it is quite a diverse county I think well the biggest pain about um Wiltshire if you're trying to do anything is it's got a massive firing range in the middle of it which is Salisbury Plain so a massive wilderness really which is lovely um, but what it means is that often people in the south look to Southampton and people in the north look to either Bath, Swindon, Oxford. And so it's really difficult to pull people together um, as a whole. And, you know, it's it's been funny. Many, we've tried all sorts of things. People never cross the plane to come to an event. Well, and is that because they might get shot at? Is that is it? <laughs> Is it actually people there with live ammunition? Oh, gosh, yes. I live on the edge of the plane, and sometimes it's like being in a war zone. Wow. You can hear the rat-a-tat-tat of the machine guns and heavy artillery and all sorts of things. Yeah, it's proper war stuff here. And is that So that must be really quite intense at the moment, because they're bringing people over from Ukraine and training them. Is Are they training them there, maybe? Oh, that'll explain it. Yeah, the house has been shaking. <laughs> wow. Yeah, not today, but the other week it was like, Honestly, I kept going to the door. I kept thinking someone was knocking at the door. Shocking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you've also but, got Stonehenge. Have you got Stonehenge in Wiltshire? Yeah, they haven't blown that up. Yeah, we've got Stonehenge and we've got Avebury as well, which is much better than Stonehenge because it's bigger and you can get in the middle of it and walk around it and there's a pub in the middle of it as well. So so for people who don't know, because I remember because I went to university in Reading and a friend of mine went down there and it's basically a stone circle around a village, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's really good. It's, 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 I always say, because people always want to go to Stonehenge, it's like, nah, it's a little <laughs> bit of an anticlimax. Always go to Avery. Brilliant. Definitely. And so, you know, life in Wiltshire sounds pretty fabulous, but it's also probably very similar to Cornwall in lots of ways, and that a load of the ways of getting from A to B are little tiny rural country lanes with yeah. poor infrastructure, bad public transport. I don't suppose you've got many trains going through Wiltshire, really. No, our trains are shocking. So yeah. um, we, I mean, parts of Wiltshire got direct line to London and stuff like that, but local trains are non-existent. You couldn't, so you have to be, especially as a disabled person, you have to be a car driver or have access to a vehicle. Um, the taxis are awful as well so we have to arrange events around um certain times of the day because of school runs um you won't get an accessible taxi um until about between 10 and 2 you can get one but otherwise it's really difficult i can remember once we had clinton farquharrison coming down um the chair of think local at personal and um he's a wheelchair user and he, he came to Chippenham. We were like, you sure you're going to be okay getting you to your hotel? And he was like, he comes from Birmingham. He's like, yeah, yeah, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Oh, gosh, it was so embarrassing. He, <clears throat> We had no means of getting him from the train station three miles up the road because we hadn't booked a taxi three days in advance. And um, they kept saying to him, could you not just get out of your chair for a little while and get into no. the taxi? And so he was just aghast because coming from Birmingham, you just couldn't believe that you couldn't just easily get from one place to another. You know, it's amazing. And I've forgotten about the school run because I tried to book a taxi a while ago, in fact, and they couldn't do it at three o'clock or anywhere near that because and that's the exact time that I needed it, of course. Yes, yeah. It's because there's limited vehicles, isn't it, in the county? And taxi drivers as well. 
Yeah, and how's like how's your bus services and all of that? Do you have accessible buses there? We do, and we've just done some really interesting. So um, part of the stuff we do uh, is our user engagement service, which is funded by Wiltshire Council and um, what was the CCG um, Clinical Commissioning Group, which is now the Integrated Care Board. I think I have that right, or it might be the Integrated Care System. Um, and we got some extra funding from Transport Wiltshire um, the bus companies in Wiltshire to talk about how we could um, highlight to how the, uh, the bus drivers needed to work with disabled passengers. And we did loads of really cool stuff. <coughs> the team headed up by someone known as Young Mary at our work. So that makes me old Mary. They did some <laughs> really good um, like focus groups on the bus, um, like Secret Shopper, um, loads of like little TikTok videos about getting on and off buses in Wiltshire and they're training the bus drivers now in disability equality and using all that they found um, and the transport's really really willing to do things differently and wants to do things differently and they gave us money to do that project so there's willingness it's and they're accessible it's just <coughs> it's just promoting it really yeah oh well that's that's good. I, I should explain to everybody that you can be a bit husky maybe every now and again and you've got a bit of a cough because you're just surviving your second round of COVID. Yes, doing so, well. Well done for surviving and thank you for being here, even though you'll probably be in bed probably. No, no, I'm feeling much better today, as Great. my grandmother always used to say. But, yeah. but um, no, um, it's just affected my voice, which is really annoying because I love talking. <laughs> it's a terrible thing so this isn't probably the right place to bring this up but i will bring it up anyway on one of the things i like reading is famous last words oh uh, yeah and there's a playwright norwegian playwright or nordic playwright called ibsen yeah. he was very poorly and he was in bed and flat out in his bed and he had a carer there looking after him feeding him and watering him and all of that and somebody came and knocked at the door and they said um how is mr ibsen today and the carer said Oh, I think he's um, I think he's doing a little bit better. And Ibsen sat up in bed and said, "On the contrary," and then died. <laughs> <laughs> Not as good as the Spike Milligan where he had on his tombstone, "I told you I was ill." <laughs> told you I was ill. But the public transport thing, so the buses thing. So the thing about what happens in Cornwall is that they put on, they put the bus timetable up, and they have a limited number of accessible buses, but you don't really know which one is which. And so the bus arrives uh, and it might yeah, be accessible yeah. and then it goes and, it, and if it is accessible then it could take you from my village for example to the town and then to get back again i have to wait for an accessible bus and it, again you can't tell from the timetable so one may show up at the time it says but also it might not so then you've got to wait another hour for the next one and i think as well we're trying to get the drivers more confident to gently and strongly challenge people being in the wheelchair spaces and I think that's part of the work we've been doing with this co-production project is like, it's OK to say to people who are sitting there, you need to move because someone in a wheelchair wants to get on. Um, because often somebody in a wheelchair then has to deal with that themselves and it makes things very uncomfortable for them. Um, whereas if the bus driver just took control and said, actually, this space is allocated, I think that would make things a lot easier for people. Because in the past, we've had it where somebody's been waiting and the driver's just driven past because somebody's been sat in the space with a buggy or you know but it doesn't have to create conflict but it just needs what we're all about with that bus project and with loads of what we do is just raising awareness and saying you know it's just about being more thoughtful so i remember there was that thing last year wasn't it was it last year or the year before even i don't know but about um people with prams taking up yeah. Accessible, yeah accessible spaces on buses you don't want to pit groups against each other like young mums against disabled people yeah because that's what that's what people love and that's really unhelpful but sometimes it is just explaining or finding ways to to explain the situation to the people so that they understand rather than creating a conflict and so the consequence of that all a bit as well is that disabled people need to have 
either their access to a car or they're their own car, but ways of getting around, they need to make their own ways of getting around. Otherwise, they're yeah. never going to get there. Yeah. And in terms of services, so what I'm thinking is lots of disabled people's organisations provide specific services. And for example, in relation to personal assistance services. So in Cornwall, we have a PA bank um, through Disability Cornwall. So that links up if a disabled person lives in Bude up in the north of the county, then there's carers up there, then it will link them with them rather than with people 100 miles away down here who, who will never get there on time. I mean, do you have ways of getting around that? Well, um, what we're trying to encourage is, and we're working with the council on this, is more micro enterprises. So we have Abby, our PA development worker, who's brilliant. She uses PAs herself and she goes and chats to parents at the school gate to local local groups and says oh have you thought about being a PA and it's different you know you, you don't have to see a carer in a tabard and see it as your life's work but actually this could really fit in with your life you know it could fit in with your school run or it could fit in with your other responsibilities and what we're finding as well is we're, what we're trying to do is group work so pool budgets we're not there yet it's really complicated to do this in terms of the funding. But in, because what it is, is someone won't travel all the way out to a village for one hour's work. But if there's within three miles, they can get like five hours work in that day. That's worth them going to. And we've even, because at the moment, as I expect in Cornwall, they're really keen to find innovative ways to help people get home out of hospital. And we said, well, would you provide a grant to pay for people um, to get their cars back on the road because a lot of the people we're talking to in towns say Salisbury the place around Salisbury which is like a city we can get loads of PAs in the city but there's loads of little villages dotted around that they can't travel to because because of the cost of living they've had to take their car off the road so they've no insurance or tax and we said or MOT even so we said if we if you could give them a grant to make their car roadworthy again, and then that would kickstart them to getting the job and being able to travel out to that job. So I will say we're trying all sorts of things yeah. to get to get that support in the villages. Because to be fair, a, a PA or a carer on a minimum wage in a dodgy car that they're not sure, you know, very safe to drive in isn't going to want to be driving around these lanes at 10 o'clock at night you know um doing the job it's because it's it's not it's not very attractive job really especially when they could be in a residential home and be yeah you know um everything there but equally we're trying to um abby and her pa uh danny um did a lovely video around what their pa um relationship was like and it was brilliant and um, it just was so, so different from the usual plastic apron tabard type PA. You know, they, they're they sort of, Danny's part of her family. Um, and so we're trying to sell care in a completely different way to, the, to what people perceive it. Because I do believe that COVID has put people off care work because they think, hang on a minute, I'm paying, paying minimum wage. And I'm expected to put my life on the line. No, thank you. You know. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I hadn't thought of that. The whole COVID thing. I mean, did it? How did it hit you as an organisation? I mean, we basically closed. I mean, loads of them across the country closed their doors. In fact, most DPOs still are not open. I think you know they found new ways of working. So the the doors have closed, and they've some of them have stopped renting uh, their, their, their buildings full stop, and so that means that they don't have that great big overhead cost because they found that during COVID they could operate in this way that we're doing now. So working from home, basically, through the through the laptop. We've always kind of done a bit of hybrid because we're such a huge geography here. So we've always done lots of telephone support, lots of... Uh, we haven't always just relied on home visits. And in the early days, we used to try and get people together for peer support and they just weren't interested. Rightly so, they were like, the only thing I've got in common with them is a benefit, yeah. nothing else. And actually, I'd rather be with my own family and friends, but just support me well here. So we were, you, you, we go, you know, we we tend to support people to keep their own networks as opposed to try and create new networks for them to link into. Yeah, we kept our office space because 
our values are really important to us and as a um, and our little tribe is really important to us so we like coming together it's more for the staff than for people coming externally in because <coughs> I think you lose a lot by being at home all the time well I think you lose a lot so one of the things that I'm interested in is about organizational knowledge so yeah. how do organizations work and operate and what are all the different jobs in that organization and who is doing what and then so if somebody phones in and says can I do this then you can either answer it or you'll know the person who will answer it so yeah that kind of organisational understanding is something that's very, very important, I think. So organisations that lose their businesses and disperse their staff in that way might find that more, and that makes it more difficult to carry the organisation forward. Yeah. So when you recruit people, you know, I always remember getting into new jobs and then they say, oh, this is how we do it around here. We do that around here. This is how that works. Yeah. You don't yeah. get that if you're working at home, do you? No, I just think there's a disconnect when you work from home all the time. We didn't even go to hybrid working, but we appreciate the bit I work from home two days a week because um, otherwise I wouldn't get anything done because I'm e very easily distracted. <laughs> yeah. But um, but I, th I think it's really the, the culture of Wiltshire Sale is really important to us. And we have found that difficult because we have expanded. We were had a bit of a weird experience in COVID in that we expanded quite rapidly and we doubled our staff because we took on new projects, which was really difficult to navigate. And I think we're still feeling the after effects like that, that as an organisation, still tr trying to bring new members of staff on board and an understanding of who we are yeah. as an organisation. I mean, loads of organisations expanded temporarily because they took on local contracts to help get through COVID, to help disabled people with stuff like with food and medicines. There's all sorts of different things. And loads of disabled people's organisations changed from being kind of reactive, shall we say. So with the telephone helpline, so I would phone into my local DPO and, not, and ask for help and assistance. And loads of DPOs did the opposite and started calling out during COVID to give people social contacts and other people who are isolated and living on their own like little remote hamlets down here in Cornwall. We were phoning them and saying, have you got everything you need? This, that and the other. And then how are you today? And how is your, you know, just doing a bit of social? Yeah, we did. We, we phoned everyone on our DP list and we launched um, a community connector service just before the community closed down so that was quite tricky let's just say um, but it's, it's gone from strength to strength now um, and that's it's more about how we support people to use their own strengths and the strengths of their community so rather than befriending or us doing on to them it's about how we grow their resourcefulness their resilience and their self-belief and get them the right resources around them so that they live well. Um, and that that works really well for us because I honestly believe in Wiltshire, I mean, I'm a Wiltshire born and bred, um, and I really believe that we're a brilliant community here and that communities want to be as inclusive as they can. Sometimes they don't advertise it because they worry about getting told off um risk assessments and safeguarding and so they do you know um it could be a bit of a like Cornwall bit of a lawless county and I love that you know I think if we don't risk stuff nothing ever develops nothing ever changes so I love a bit of naughtiness with the stuff we do we try and take risks you know our, one of our main lines at which still is don't ask for permission first ask for forgiveness later <laughs> and and uh, it just works for us because if you wait for, well, A, why would you wait for the powers at B? Because who are they to tell us what to do? And B, they have to go through so many committees, nothing ever gets done anyway. <laughs> but I think with us, we run the Make Someone Welcome campaign. And all that is, is saying um, it's just brilliant to be inclusive of everybody in your community, not just disabled people, everybody. And being inclusive can mean can be as simple as saying hello to someone at the bus stop it doesn't have to be a big grand gesture of volunteering or befriending or anything like that and it works better when you connect with someone as an equal as opposed to helping them or oh you poor person with all your needs I'm going to do on to you you know it works better for both sides if you meet as equals and when we started that campaign quite a few years ago 
we we developed a training package and I can remember a training package on how to be inclusive and I can remember doing that training package and being really embarrassed because actually nobody needed to be trained on being inclusive they got it everyone was doing it they yeah. just weren't making a song and dance about it you know I don't know really so much about Wiltshire but I guess in the center of it you don't get much throughput of people I mean because like what happens in Cornwall is you know the negative thing that people say about Cornwall is they know we're like a Christmas stocking they say the nuts always sink to the bottom Oh, and okay. <laughs> people get to the end of Cornwall and then don't really move for generations, you know. Right. And there are people who've been down here and don't go very far from down here because it's, there's not there's no through road or no through way. And I suppose in the centre of Wiltshire there'll be similar sort of places where there's small little villages with you know kind of static populations who really do know each other and know everybody for each other. Yeah, yeah. And we've had a bit of an influx of, you know, I can remember the yuppies coming and things like that and because we've got a train link to London but yeah our communities are pretty solid and you know their little working man's associations and stuff like that it's there's there's a lot of love and care within the villages that I think can sometimes be overlooked yeah and people really do look out for each other I mean down here yeah. you know, in my local village everybody knows everyone but that works both ways and so it means that everybody is looking out for everybody else all the time yeah yeah can be a Great. bit annoying if you're a teenager. <laughs> well, everything's annoying when you're a teenager, I think, isn't it? That's the job of it. <laughs> when you're trying to do naughty things and there's 100 people know who you are, where yeah. you live. But kind of the, um, the, the the sort of the whole, you know, the sum of all of those things, if you haven't got great railway links and then your buses can be a bit intermittent and they probably come along once every hour and you don't have a car. And in fact, right now with this snowy weather, the little tiny lanes don't get gritted. You know, there yeah. can be situations yeah. with people getting really quite isolated, I'd have thought. Yeah. That's yeah. certainly what happens here in a rural area. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, and I think that's up to us just to just to try and make those local connections because they're a lot more sustainable than trying to get in big services in to deliver. Yeah. You get lost in big services. Yeah. Um, but if those local connections where you can see it are a lot more sustainable. And they're, they're done because there's a relationship between people, whereas a service, there's not that often, there, there might not be that relationship. So a lot of the stuff we do, it's my phone, a lot of the stuff we do is relational, all about relationships. Because if you care for somebody, then you'll do something for them. And we were, talk, we were talking a lot at the moment about community response, and I'm very nervous about... Um, there's a lot with the NHS plans and changes around, oh, well, the community will do it. But what they don't understand is the community isn't a resource to exploit, yeah. you know, um, and a community can't be in crisis response mode all the time. So, yes, the community really galvanised itself in COVID, but that's because we had a pandemic. People went back to live their lives. But also communities work when people know each other so you can't try and scale up everything that happened in covid because a lot of it was street to street neighbor to neighbor and that's what you want to um you know nourish and let grow slowly but they kind of always want to scale it up and turn it into something and then turn it almost into a service yeah and and a lot of the services now are disappearing and being cut, you know, with the we had 10 years of austerity or whatever it was. And then and now we're in a situation where it's going to look like it's going to be carrying on. And local authorities in many ways are getting well, they're getting less funding than they ever did get. And so yeah. local authorities know that there are services and they know that there are needs out there. And so they kind of rely a bit more on us as the voluntary sector organisations and I think think that we will pick things up if things really do fall through the net or we'll pick people up if they fall through the net. Yeah, yeah, I know. And and it, it I don't know about you, but we have sort of the way they're talking to the VCAC here is like we're we're one of a statutory partner and we're sort of I've I've shied away from some of that because I think I love working for a disabled people's organization. I feel we were sort of forged in the civil rights movement and we are quite radical 
different organisations that are prepared to push boundaries. And I think it'll be really sad if we just become part of the system. You know, that's interesting because I've always said that disabled people's organisations are a different sector almost. Yeah. I mean, you could, a lot of people say that you're just a subsector or the voluntary and community sector, but we have our own thing as well. Yeah. And so there's one thing is that we're kind of controlled and led by disabled people. So as disabled people, I think we're used to finding the gaps and finding the way through the world. And so our organisations kind of do similar so that yeah. whole thing that you were saying earlier about the wild, wild west, you know, we, we're kind of used to doing that. You have to take a bit of a risk, otherwise nothing ever gets done. Yeah, yeah. Um, and being so, massively flexible yeah. and a bit bit naughty and quick and quick as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, somebody was saying to me about the um, the software engineers in Silicon Valley. They, um, they will put something into practice on them, come up with the idea on the Sunday night, put it into practice on a Monday, it breaks on the Tuesday, they fiddle around with it and they have it back up and working on the Wednesday. You imagine a local authority. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, we're going to change how direct payments are delivered. Right, we've got to put something into practice on the Monday. Yeah. <laughs> Just would laugh him, would it? No, you know, local authority, <laughs> yeah, they move very slowly. It's committee by committee, isn't it? Yeah, but I'm sort of going with the Silicon Valley thing. That's what I want to be. That's what I want the organisation to be like is quick you know we learn from our mistakes yeah and so do you see a difference between i mean you must have contacts with dpos in urban areas so in places like london or other cities bristol i suppose would be the nearer one yeah um we don't have a lot we do we do some, we do some joint visiting around direct payments i i just there's a little bit of envy going on at how quickly they can mobilize disabled people to rally around things because we struggle I don't know if you find that it's just everyone it's really difficult to like we couldn't man the barricades very easily in Wiltshire a first we'd have to find somewhere pretty central to put a barricade up and there'd be (laughs) loads of arguments about that and uh um and so I can remember when it was was it the Independent Living Fund? Can you remember the Independent Living I Fund? That, yeah. And they got rid, they of it. got rid of it. Yeah. And we tried really hard to get people together as individuals. They were really cross and sad that they were losing the ILF. Yeah. But we could not mobilize them into a force. <laughs> yeah. So we're looking, we're doing it now more and more, but we're doing it through Facebook and we're using social media a lot more to to do what we can't do sort of in physical person and so that kind of leads on to the next question is is you know which is like kind of disabled people's organizations do you think we are you know you you mentioned that we grew out the civil rights struggle and we've evolved into being what we are today do you think the future for dpos looks similar to what we are today because i think personally that we'll get lots in order to attract a younger generation to get on board in many ways they are much more tech savvy than old people like me and they will operate them in different ways. So they'll, DPOs will change and evolve, I think, and sort of fill up more of a virtual space. So when you get that mobilization, it might be easier to mobilize disabled people through that virtual space rather than actually get them to a specific place and time on the Tuesday afternoon. Yeah, so, I think we, we're all, so we're just about to start this. We're really excited. We've been trying to get funding to do young people's co-production for years and years and years and we've got it and we're going to be starting that next year and we're looking at things even like having forums on minecraft um do you know minecraft minecraft it's shoot shoot people game is it no it's lovely minecraft you build things it's like lego but online and and like um kids love it um it's really creative so we're looking almost to hold co-production groups on on things like that. And, um, you know, like having the focus groups on buses. So actually taking activities to people where they are, as opposed to expecting people to come into a church hall with a cup of tea and a biscuit. Yeah. I think we have to move, especially, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, isn't it? And for us, it's like, you can't do that in Cornwall. You can't do it in Wiltshire. You can't just say, right, we're going to meet here on Tuesday and it to be really easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, but I don't even necessarily think it's that easy in other places either. Because I remember I was in London, went up to London 
this is a couple of years ago now, and we stayed in a hotel in the East End of London for a meeting. And so my wife went out to go and find out. She's not, you know, I use an electric scooter and she's ambulance. So she just went off to go and find somewhere for us to have our dinner. And she went to all these places full of hipster youngsters all doing their laptops and doing their lovely lives, having a brilliant time and reading the papers and chatting and gossiping. I couldn't get into even one of them. Really? Yeah. And so we ended up going, we ended up getting a people a delivery to the hotel because we were in the hotel. So that was yeah. really dull. But I suddenly think that actually London might not be as easy as I thought it would be. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think, I think a while ago we decided, uh, although I really like linking with national organisations like Social Care Futures and Think Local App Personal and Disability Rights UK, where I've sort of been linked with yourself and things like that. I think that's really useful for my understanding, but we are local in our focus. Um, and I think partly why we decide to just concentrate on Wiltshire is because it's overwhelmingly bleak sometimes. And I think we we need to feel like change is possible. So if we can make change happen locally, it sustains us and we cannot change the cost of living crisis nationally. We cannot change the social care funding nationally, but we focus on making life good for disabled people in Wiltshire. So I don't tend to get too invested on what's going on nationally, that day-to-day -day experience. Um, it just sometimes just looks a bit more, as you say, cool. In in um in like the cities, there just seems to be, but maybe it isn't as accessible, you know. Maybe maybe it's a myth. <laughs> yeah, you know, they've got things. We we always end up going to places like the Westfield Shopping Centre, which I was would never have gone there when I was younger. It's not the sort yeah. of place I'd go to, but it's absolutely accessible and they've got restaurants and bars and toilets and shops and blah. Yeah, yeah. When, yeah. I, when I was there in London last time, Peter Andre appeared on stage. Oh, really? You can't ask for anything more, can you? I don't think. <laughs> well, that's a reason to stay out of the cities. <laughs> <laughs> so you, um, there's a couple of things you said that you'd like to talk about. So, well, I think we probably covered them, actually. You know, different ways of meeting and connecting and delivering services and like things, you know, like you were saying through the, what was the name of the software? Oh, Minecraft. Minecraft I, yeah. I only know lots about it because I have... Um, a 12 year old son there you go. <laughs> but it is about that it is about how can we like that's what co-production is about you almost co-produce how you're going to co-produce because there's no point putting on events that people don't want to come to no. and I think you know I as a carer my child's got learning disability and I don't go to any parent groups I wouldn't touch them with a barge pole and that's not because I don't believe in peer support or um, I'm too busy and I've got a good enough, close enough group of friends and family that I get my support from them. Again, it's relational. Yeah. They get me, they understand me, they know my son. Um, and so for me, when I started at Wiltshire Seal, it was like I I came in to, to look at peer support and we kind of moved away from it really quickly because we just realised people didn't want it in that way, you know. They didn't want us engineering it. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because I was, you know, I, the study that I was, that I did my PhD, I was really interested in different kinds of capital and social capital is a really interesting thing in the way that it works. So people with a common interest often get together. So like you say, peer support, talking about a specific issue. But then if that specific issue is all you're talking about, then suddenly it's like, well, why are we here? I don't want a cup of tea with you because we don't do anything else in common apart from talk about that And it could be thing. that sort of social comparison type thing can be really useful at times. I worked with Strokes Five as many years ago and we did something when when they were, when people were just discharged from hospital and very, very frightened yeah. because the stroke had been such a sudden and unexpected event. And we found social comparison was very important to them. They're in a group where they didn't felt other they felt very safe and they were able to say, oh, well, I've got speech issues, but at least I can walk or I'm in a wheelchair, but at least I can talk, you know, and they used it to everybody used it in a really positive way. But that was for a specific time and place. And then they as they grew more confident, they wanted to reconnect with their networks and their communities. So yeah. I think it's it's just listening to people, isn't it? And what they want. But, yeah, I think DP. 
I think as long as we keep our values straight and our values are forged in, in sort of steel, aren't they? As a as a disabled people's organization. Yeah. Um that everything, nothing about us without us, choice and control, that type of thing, then I think that gives us loads of scope to evolve and change. And you know, but what I can't see myself in any other voluntary sector organization because nowhere else would allow for and the the word radical has almost become a funny word now, hasn't it? It's like it's 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 sort of been overused but I think radical really applies to us and I'm really proud to be sort of you know like a radical organization you know I think we're really good at doing things that are very difficult to do so you get given 58p and suddenly it's a hundred thousand pounds that you've got out of it yeah I mean that's a bit extreme but obviously you know we're very good at stretching budgets to be to be able to do the things that we want to do yeah we kind of switch frameworks a bit so that if a funding application comes out for x then we apply for it and we get it because we do X, but we'll also put do a little bit of Y and Z on the top of yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and then add that value and then that goes into the tender. Yeah. And then you say, look at all the added value we gave there. And also not letting funding stop us. So, you know, you can sit around and go, with Make Someone Welcome, for example, that was never funded for the first four years. Yeah. We just started it as a, we, that's when we discovered social media and how useful it could be for us and then we just kind of let it grow itself and trusted it to grow and then as as it grew it got more attention and then we could start getting funding so it's like build it and they will come <laughs> yeah well you know we are the fa- we are the future yeah <laughs> what, does the fu- what does the future look like you think for dpos you know well i, I for us, I'm really excited and I think we stay a little bit to left field from the, I I have kept out. So, so at the moment, as I said, there's a real drive to have the VCSE as this very professional, um, homogenous um, sector. So VCSE that, is? Um... The voluntary sector, uh, the voluntary mm-hmm. community uh, service enterprise. Something no, that's really. not right. Anyway, it's all the other voluntary sector organisations. Yeah. There's lots of highfalutin meetings that I'm invited to. I'm very careful about the meetings I go to because actually I I ask all the staff to use a reflective question in, in their daily work. And is this making a difference to, the pe- to disabled people in Wiltshire? If the answer is no, don't go, don't get involved. And that's from their daily work to the stuff I do. So we reflect on what we do and make sure that we keep on the mission. But I think we're we're interesting in that we can, you know, we can be a little bit left field, but we get stuff done, don't we? We're doers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Doers, you know, time is of the essence at all times, I think. Yeah. Is there anything that you would like to talk about? I think we've covered all the stuff we said we were going to talk about. I think I think the rurality is an issue. I think that there's a big gap in the whole disability world and the disability field. Certainly I come from a disability studies background and there's very little research in the field of disability studies in relation to disability and rurality. And I think we do have a big set of our own issues and problems because of all the infrastructure issues. We get a lot more people who are lonely and isolated. I think we probably get a lot more mental health issues because people can feel you know, isolated and lonely sometimes. And it's difficult to get hold of stuff. It's difficult to go out and get a bag of sugar or a cup of tea when you want those things if you live in the middle of nowhere and you can't drive a car or whatever. Yeah. So I think there is a whole set of issues around disability and rurality, which isn't, which is though, it relates to those things, but also more. But, yeah. Um, and I definitely think for younger disabled people who aren't given the opportunity to leave home, um, and end up living in a very rural setting that's some you know there's people we work with who are really bloody miserable because they're a young person who should be going out exploring who they are as a person going out getting drunk or not but you know having lots of different experiences and they can't because they can't get the right care so they get a big agency coming in to deliver their care 
They're living at home with mum and dad. And that's not right for anybody from the age of like 18 to 25. That should be a time of exploring. And I think maybe this is where I'm jealous of cities because you get um, things like if, say, if I was, we we're in a big university city, you could get things like gig buddies in place where you get volu- volunteers coming together and taking people off to gigs and, you know, the whole stay up late campaign and stuff like that. That's a lot easier to do in a city. Yeah. But if you've got a young person who's stuck out in a village in the middle of nowhere, and we have worked with with people like that throughout the years, um, who, who just has quite complicated care needs, but is a young person yeah. who wants their own life and their own identity and their own job. That's that's the bit I think we've got to crack. Yeah, no, I agree. There's a stay up late event I remember in Penzance a few years ago, but, you know, from places, villages like mine, which is, you know, is only five miles away from Penzance. Well, how are they going to get there and how is it going to work out and then how are they going to get home again? And it's yeah, all of that kind of process, really. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you're in a like university city, say, yeah. for example, or just um, then that would that would work, wouldn't it? You could yeah. do that. It'd be brilliant. It'd be easier. So it makes life harder living in <laughs> living in these huge rural places. Um, but, you know, we have to just thought in terms of things like second homes and second home ownership. And so a lot of our properties around me, there's a village down the road from me and it's like 70 percent empty in the dark months of the year. Yeah, it's horrendous. Homes, you know. And so house yeah. prices have gone through the roof. So local people can't buy houses. So for disabled people to find an accessible property and to get onto that accessible property ladder, that's yeah. a nightmare. Yeah. In fact, if a local authority, so I know somebody they wanted to move out, they became they were like 18, 19, 20 years old. They wanted to move out from their parents' home. <laughs> so they applied to the local authority for an accessible property and they got they found an accessible property, but it was 70 miles away. And they so you're ripping out, family. ripping them away from community, yeah. family, all the things we say that matters. Yeah, you're ripping them away from that. You know, they wanted to move out of home, but not that out of home. We do have that. that we, yeah, we do have that here. So we have the housing stock, but it's not in the right. It's not where people live. Yeah. So, it, so, and because we have the same problems with you with huge vast swathes of green. Um, which is lovely but what it means is you take you're taking people away from everything they know and love and then shoving them in a house where they've got no connection they don't feel safe they don't feel well supported Um, and we have been working with the council on their housing policy just saying look the things that matter to people are having really good relationships in their lives having communities where they feel valued Um, you can't just shove someone in. bricks and mortars are the first thing you know it's like you the you would have done this because you're that i keep referring to this at the moment the maslow's hierarchy of needs exactly the bricks you and can't the just do the bottom, the bottom bit yeah you've got to you know you've got to do all the bits of the triangle yeah. and make sure that people get to live well as 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 opposed to just living yeah but at the moment i mean this is why i i've I try the organization tries to stay optimistic in terms of the wins we get but at the moment it is really difficult to see that people are even struggling just to you know get to that that bottom rung is working no well it's very difficult times that we're in and we're about we're going into the winter and it's it's going to be difficult you're right we yeah have to focus on our local stick with our local wins and we have to win locally because it's you know, and that your your question that you ask yourself, is it going to make a difference to people locally, is a big question. And that's the question I think we all keep at the front of our minds all the time. Just to stay motivated, really, because otherwise you will, as you know, if you, it's, as somebody accused us of once, we were at some London events and I was like, oh, we only concentrate on Wiltshire. And they were like, you sound like such a yokel. And I'm like, that's fine. I'm proud to be a yokel. Yeah, when I go to London, I've got a stri- stick of straw in my mouth every time I go there, and I'm pleased of it. In fact, you can tell when you go to the cities because everyone looks nice and neat and tidy, and I just look like scruffy 1970s Theo. Always mud up, always mud splattered. Exactly. 
Hey, listen, it's lovely talking to you. Lovely talking to you. Yeah. Thank you very I much feel I've talked at you again, but never no, mind. That's great. That's, that's the point. I like it. Thank you very much for your time. No worries. And the voice held out. The voice held out. And um, it's that time of year. Have a very Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. Cheers, Theo. Cheers. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.